Well, bless you, bless you. This is Brother Hubbard of the Kingsley Terrace Church of Christ, a church where God is glorified, the saints are sanctified, and our lives are changed. We're coming to you from the wonderful city of Indianapolis, Indiana, to share a word with you about how to build a healthy and a stronger relationship. Thank God for the pounds and the invitation to share with you and a chance to talk about how to enhance our relationships, make them better, and make them stronger and greater. purpose that God has given us to bond together in these relationships with each other. Let's go to God together for a brief word of prayer to look and to understand how to build a relationship with somebody based on their soul and not based on their role. Let's pray briefly together. Father God, we just come to you and we come in acknowledgement and thankfulness for your grace, your mercy, your strength, and your peace that you pour so richly and deeply into our lives. We pray that we'll Take this opportunity to learn how to build and enhance relationships and to make them better. We ask you to guide us and keep us consistently in your care. It's in the wonderful and merciful and gracious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. Friend, let's begin this process, this role, talking about how to build a strong connection and a bond with our partner. But certain fundamental things ought to be considered as we talk about this sense of bonding with somebody to love them to their soul to love them to their soul. First of all, I want to be aware with you that, that if you introduce yourselves and answer the following questions, think about this concept about your relationship. If you looked at your marriage with your partner, would you see yourself as a drama, as an action, as a comedy, as a horror film, as a Western, as an adventure? What kind of movie would be made about you? Or what kind of movie would be made about the relationship that you have? Are you guys like a horror story that folks are looking at? Are you like, uh, like, like what would the setting be in this, in this film we watched about your relationship or your personal lives? What, what would the plot be? What would your clothing be like? What stands out about you? What insights can be gained from seeing your marriage from this perspective? Because if you see your relationship as a place of horror or adventure or thrill or a romance, it gives insight to how you function in the context of this relationship. So, so where do you go from here? When you see your relationship together and look at yourself and look at your mate and see how you interrelate with each other, what bond and connection exists in that relationship? Well, consider these thoughts along this line, friend. It, your marriage has two parts to it. There's the you in the relationship. And there's the other part, the I in your relationship. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Don't forget this workshop. We encourage you to connect with us. Sister Hubbard and I will do these things with you online or in, part, in person. Give us a call if you need us. Well, let's go back to our workshop together. So, so first of all, there has to be a reboot to get started. Starting over in a relationship, friend, already in your marriage and your connection, you've got some breaking bonds together. You've got some struggles that you're facing there. There are pains, hurts, and challenges already inside the context of this relationship. So how do you begin from scratch? How do you start over all over again? Well, first of all, two things are required to begin your relationship. Marriages have trouble on certain years. The main years are 2, 5, 7, 10, and after 17. Two years are hard because by the second year, you begin to realize just how much different you are and, and the adjustments and changes of the connection together that, that you like it hot, I like it cold, or, or you like to sound on, like sound off. We learn the things we don't connect with in the first two years. Uh, I call the fifth year the year when the fun is over because by the fifth year, you begin to realize all the things in your relationship that your partner's choices affect your own personal life. So the fifth year is a treacherous time in a marriage. And then the seventh year, we call the seven year itch. By the seventh year in a relationship, it's the year that feels like forever. And by that, I mean, if your marriage is going great, I love this, I'm never going to leave. If it's not going well, then by the seventh year, many people quit. It's a year where marriages have trouble. The next one is the 10th year. By the, by the 10th year, we call the 10th year the year of boredom because by the 10th year, normally you're functioning on a pattern already and in the pattern that you're in, it's hard to change. So I wanna challenge you to be aware of these year dynamics. The last one is the 17th year. After 17 or 20 years, you changed. The person you were when you got married is not the person that you are right now. So you talk about this relationship, how do we build it together? Right now in your bond, there, there's some pains, there's some hurts, there's some struggles, there's some frustrations. How do you go forward in a relationship from all the challenge you've had so far? Two things required to build from here. First of all, 
take responsibility. You've got to take responsibility for your own choices. You must begin by seeing the part that you have played in where your relationship is and where your life is right now. You can't stand side on the sideline and say, I'm innocent. I ain't got nothing to do with this. If your life is involved, you are a part of what's happening even right now. So understand the first requirement for taking steps to reboot this connection, to make this relationship better, you must be willing to accept the fact that, that, that you take responsibility for the part that you have played. Secondarily, accept the reality of your past and choose to live beyond it. What you've been through has not defined you. The ups and the downs, some bad choices you made in this relationship, some bad choices you made inside your life. To begin over any point in life, one, you must take responsibility, and two, realize you are not stuck where you are. Your marriage is not stuck, and you are not stuck. It's still not too late to make a change. The greatest gift that God gives us is the power and the capacity to choose a different point for our future than we had in our past. So let's go forward in understanding how we build this relationship together. What, what part do you play? If there are problems in your marriage, I would declare there's a part that you play. I know, I know the sense that, no, no, Brother Hubbard, you don't understand. It's that man I'm married to. It's that woman. It's them kids. It's everybody else's fault. Let me help you with this dynamic, friend. List your affairs that the part that you played in making the relationship difficult. You don't have any? Okay, let's get you some help. Ask your kids, ask them, ask your children, what, what do you see that I may have done that has made my relationship more difficult with, your, with, your, with, my, with my mate? Ask your children, oh, they're not helping? Okay, well, ask, ask your parents. You, you know me, you've watched me all my life. What have I done based on what you've seen that's added stress and frustration to this relationship? You need more help? Okay, I'll help you. Ask your, ask your in-laws, ask your sister-in-law, ask your brother-in-law, ask your, your, your parents, your, your, par your, your mate's parents, what have you seen, what do you see in me or from me that signifies why the relationship that we're in are having challenges? You need more help? <laughs> Friend, uh, ask your partner. But, but essentially, the part is that Their fault. Here's the part they played in our situation. Well, okay. Here's the key. First of all, friend, understand this: you will never become who you want to be if you keep blaming everyone else for who you are. You're not happy about how things are in the relationship. First step is decide I'll stop pointing blame. Along that line, consider this thought as well: the one who blames others has not begun their lesson. A person who blames himself has begun the lesson. A person who blames no one has finished the lesson. In other words, the key here in deciding where this relationship goes is to stop pointing blame. Don't do like Adam, don't do like Eve, don't start blaming, start looking within to identify how to make this better. Third, thirdly, along this line, consider this, stop blaming others because you are as happy or as miserable as you choose to be. My partner does not make me happy, you're right. They don't make you happy. Nobody makes you happy. It's a choice. You would choose to be as happy or as miserable as you choose to be. It is a choice. Well, consider these thoughts in conjunction with that idea, friend, that if you, some people complain about everything, or blame others for your problems, or never be grateful. If you do that, it makes you a failure. Don't complain about everything and don't blame others, and don't function ungratefully. And, and next of all, consider this thought in conjunction. So you fail all the time, but you're not a failure until you start blaming somebody else for what happens. And of course, next of all, friend, when you blame and criticize others, you're actually avoiding some kind of a truth about you. We point to others to get the attention off of ourselves. 
it shares a truth about you. And then along this last line, a self-absorbed person only can see the faults of others, but they are often colorblind to their own. All I'm trying to establish is you can't begin the process of building a relationship until you do some inward assessment of yourself. You, it's key that you take some time to look at you. You can't begin to rebuild a relationship with your partner as long as you're not looking at the part you're playing and making it the way that it is. Well, let's consider some thoughts beyond this. Friend, there's some myths I got to share with you because many of you who got married, bless your heart, you believe some things that were true. Yes, you did. We're, we're going to love each other happily ever after. And, and once we marry each other, and let's be honest about it, men, men mess this thing up. Men will lie to you. It ain't intentional. See, you see, you got to understand the distinction between men and women in relationships, right? Women, women are responsive in relationships to sound. Men are responsive to sight. He was drawn to you initially based on what he could see. She was drawn to you based on what she could hear. That's why the Bible says when Adam saw Eve, that's what he said. Oh, look, that is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. He saw her. Uh, in Genesis 5, the, when the sons of God saw the daughters of men. That's what men get messed up what they can see. Women get messed up by what they hear. That's why the devil talked to Eve. Because the way to get to woman is to get through her mind. And so understand that you have some myths, some false perspectives of relationship already built into your mind of how it works and it does not work the way you think it works. Well, let's get rid of some, some myths before we go further because these myths right now have got you all torp in your relationship. First myth is actually this. Care given and received is, un is unconditional. That I will give you an unconditional kind of love and you will give me an unconditional kind of love. Mm. No, bless your heart, you're right. It should be what you seek to achieve. But unfortunately, only God has the capacity, it would seem, to love people without any type of condition. Most of us have conditions that we have. I, I do have some level of expectations of my, I love my children, I love my grandkids, I love my mate, I love the church. However, to be honest with you, I do have some expectations and when they're not met, I can not feel differently. So it's a false idea that your partner will love you unconditionally. There will be conditions, not because they mean, because they're human. Well, secondly, consider this thought. Romantic love is permanent. Baby, what gets you married ain't going to keep you married. What gets you married does not keep you married. I can't let you go. I got to hold your hands. I just don't even know to eat. All I got to do is look inside your eyes and I'll feel fulfilled. Bless you. Bless you. But that ain't going to last. You will get hungry. Romantic love is not permanent. Thirdly, thirdly, consider this thought in conjunction. You should love and accept each other as you are without trying to change them. Beautiful concept. I, I love you just the way you are. Beautiful idea. Beautiful concept. And initially, in a sense, I do. But you see, the reason we kind of change a person is because I met you and you are as close as I can find to someone who bonds and connects with me. But because I'm changing every day and I'm being molded every day and you're being changed every day, therefore, every day we're changing in light of that reality, you should understand you will always seek to get your partner to change something that's different than how you met them. It's a myth. And so because that's a myth, it's actually not true. Well, myth number four, problems don't matter. Love is enough. And if we love each other, our love will survive. No matter what problems happen, problems matter. I'm not saying problems will destroy your relationship, but I'm saying to you that the troubles you have in your life will impact your relationship. Almost 70% of the problems in your relationship are, are things that will always be there. It's 30 to 40% of the things you have problems with in your relationship that are discussable, changeable, modifiable issues, resolvable issues, but the majority of issues in your relationship is because that's just the way he is and that's just the way she is. And you've got to learn to live, love them, love them in spite of that. Well, the next one I want you to see Number five along this line is conflict is a sign of a bad relationship. No, 
No, good relationships have conflict. Good relationships can disagree. Good relationships declare that I like this about you. I don't like that about you. Even the book of Acts, the sixth chapter, when there's a Grecian widow conflict and tension taking place that existed because they did not know how to handle conflict. Conflict is a natural part of every relationship and knowing how to argue is the key, but being wrong in how you argue is the difficulty. But the fact of the matter that every relationship that's healthy will have some form of conflict. It's a natural part of what happens in relationships and it's key to accept that realization. Well, let's look at a few more of these before we close off this segment. First of all, if you love me, you would say, if you love me, you would know what I want without me even asking. Your partner is not a mind reader. They don't know what you like and they don't know what you dislike unless you tell them. See, the problem is this. Sometimes we call this a negative pattern of communication. Sometimes I don't know what I'm thinking. How can I know what you're thinking? So it's a false concept, the idea that because someone loves you, they can read your mind. They can't read your mind regardless of what they care about you. It doesn't matter. Next of all, my partner will always feel lovingly toward me. No, they won't. Sometimes, I'll tell you the secret. Sometimes I don't even like me. So your partner will not always see you lovingly. There'll be times they will say, I don't like you today. I don't want to see you or talk with you or be around you. Nothing wrong with that. That's a natural part of every relationship. I love my kids and my grandkids, but I don't want to be with them 24 seven either. But number eight, if we lose this excitement, we will become bored with each other. No, 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 no. Life has ups and downs, ebbs and flows. It's, you will become bored because it's not exciting. Then number nine, commitment, curious loneliness. You will always have some form of loneliness, even married. Don't believe that getting married means you won't feel lonely anymore for the rest of your life. You will always experience some forms of loneliness. It doesn't have to control you. It doesn't have to dominate you, but you will experience loneliness. And then number 10, I'm the only friend my partner ever needs. Friend, you share your life. You don't surrender your life. You don't be, my, my wife does not become many me. She retains her family, her relationships and bonds. We share our lives. You don't eliminate your life and become a copy of someone else. It's not absorption. It's sharing your life or blending together or two have come together, become one flesh. When being one does not mean you no longer exist. It means that you both exist and you learn to partner those relationships together. And then of course, children can help save a marriage. They can you can't save your marriage based on adding kids to the relationship. Kids don't save marriages. Kids are work. They, they desire and have needs, friends. So it's a myth to believe the savior relationship. Well, let's go further and understand this. What about the idea of falling in and out of love? It's key to comprehend this concept, friend. Why, why did you fall in love? You love your partner. I know the term fall in love suggests it's a hole in the ground you fell into, but it's not a hole in the ground. But I do want you to understand how to think about the idea of what does it mean to be in love with someone? Okay, well, what made you fall in love in the past? What drew you to people in the past? You're, I love my mate when I first met them, my first girlfriend at 14. Okay, what made you feel you love somebody? I want you to realize this. You don't love people because, and you don't love your mate because of how you feel about them. No, 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 no. The most selfish thing you will ever do is love someone. You don't love them because of how you feel about them. You love them because of how you feel about yourself when you are with them. You love your wife because, when, baby, when I get around you, I feel like a better man. It's key, keep that man feeling important around you. Well, honey, I, when I look at you, baby, I just feel like a wonderful woman because I'm around you. That, that's the key, she's gotta feel great when she's around you, understand this. You love your partner because of how you feel when you're around them, which tells you when I stop feeling good about myself, I'll stop thinking that I love you. I love you because when I get around you, I feel so great. But when I get to the point, I can't stand being around you. I don't wanna to talk to you. I don't wanna be near you. I don't wanna be around you. When I get to the place in my life, I don't want to be around you because it caused me more pain to be around you than it does to not be around you. That's when love ends. And I want you to realize therefore, friend, love ends through loss. 
Addictions can cause a loss. Money, mishandling, finances, disrespect, all these things affect your love. You can lose the context of love. Half couples quit. Most of, of, of the other half are roommates. We, a, lot of you, a lot of you right now, you're married. Bless your heart. How long have you been together? 30 years, 40 years, 50 years. Oh, bless your heart. What are y'all? We roommates. We eat together periodically. We watch different shows. We live in a place together. We are, we are two ships passing in the night. So what's the answer? If your relationship has become this kind of a two ships in a night kind of thing, what's the answer? What do you do now to get a healthy relationship? How do you save this, 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 this uh, albatross hanging around somebody's neck? What do you do to, to make this worth the time and energy? How do we save and change this bond that's gone crazy? What do we do with this to make it better? You got to choose love, but understand the dynamic. Love is not a mystery, just like gravity and, and the, the gravity is a, is a law that is not based upon on how you feel, health laws, uh, if certain foods will make your, your body healthy, certain rules work. There's, love has an equation that works like everything else does. Solving a relationship problem does not guarantee you will love your partner more. Understand what I'm suggesting? Sometimes couples say, we can go for counseling and counseling is going to make us love each other better. Counseling will address the problem you've got right now. Counseling will allow you to get past that barrier and the fight you're having right now. Counseling can, can move some barriers out of the way. But a lot of times couples assume it's going to solve all of our issues. At some point, even when the counseling is over, it's not necessarily going to make you love your partner more or better. It addresses the issues you're facing right now. And so, so if you're basically the same person in character, personality, and nature, then why does your love change? You got the same personality when you met with each other, same basic nature. Why has love changed? Well, we'll understand this to get to this, friend. It's God is a social being, and He made us in His image, right? So, which makes us social beings. I need. I need to connect. I need to connect with somebody. I need, to, I need the bond. Love is awesome because it fulfills our basic need to connect with another person. Human connection begins inside the womb. When you're inside your mother's womb, there's a bond, there's a, there's a connection you have. You, you, you don't even have to aware it exists, but it continues from your mother's womb when she picks you up and she holds you and they, they cool with you and talk to you and, and, and hold you and, and kiss you and caress you. You and I need the affection and the care of love. Being connected to somebody is an actual need. God said to Adam, it's not good. It's not good that you're alone. Adam didn't even know what was wrong. He had the presence of God, but he, God said, you, you need others in the realm like you. It's not good, Adam, that you're alone. You need other people. You need others like you. And if you understand that, that's why you keep on trying, you keep on going back, you keep on fighting, you keep, you don't quit, give up because you understand at your core, I need love. So the dilemma is faults are thick where love is thin. But what are you trying to say, preacher? Well, here's, let me explain it to you in this context here. Where love is thick, when, 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 when you have a whole lot of love for somebody, the things wrong with them seem very small. If you really love your partner, it's difficult to focus on, concentrate on, and spend all your energy and time on their faults. Matter of fact, the more you love someone, the more negligible their, their, their shortcomings seem, the, the smaller those things about them seem to be off. And you feel the same way about your children. If you have kids at home, you, you look at your kids and others say, that child is misbehaving. No, my baby's having a bad day today. Yes, that child has some faults, but because I love them so much, their faults aren't enormous. Like you see them because you don't love them because I love them. I see their faults as smaller. I can work with those faults because how I see them. That's why the love component is so key in your relationship. Love Loving your mate is important to you. Would you attempt to venture knowing that half the folk who tried it failed? Over half the folk get married, end up divorcing. So why the folk keep trying? 
But you got to understand, for because love is not a logical decision. You didn't marry your partner. Well, I sat down and calculated it out. It really, it made more sense uh, on paper to go ahead and marry you. Don't get me wrong. Some folk have done that, but I would advocate the idea that, that love is more than a calculation. It connects with our primal need to be connected. It is a, it's like a stimulant. It's like a drug. Love is like a drug that you get stuck on. The problem is that the drug called romance part of your love will eventually wear off in about two years usually. So to solve this, you got to do something different. I want to share with you before our time runs out. I want to share with you what do you do to build a connection? What do you do to stay bonded together in spite of the challenge? Beyond romance is compatibility and personality. 90% of reality is perception. 90% of what is real to you is in your mind. 90% of the perception of how you see life is based on how you think. Therefore, therefore, if your partner, if you love your partner, you can see their action as being harsh or see their action as being compassionate, all based on how you see them and how you love them. So usually your compatibility is not changing in a relationship. It's your connection that's changed. You gotta learn how to love more deeply, which allows you even to see the unlikable things about them in a positive light. So, so how, how do you do that, preacher? How do I look at that person? How, sister girl was asking, how do I look at that rascal and see him in a positive light when I see all that bad stuff he's doing? Or he can declare, Brother Hubbard, you don't understand how she handles business, how she does things. How do you expect me to love her and care for her? How do I see her in a positive light with all the junk I've been through dealing with her? Let's share some concepts that will help you with this. There are four responses. First of all, understanding because the love has changed in your relationship. It ain't like it was when you got married. And, and was dancing down the aisle together. Yeah, this is it. I'm married now. We's married now. Oh, yeah, okay. Beautiful. Bless you. Wedding was great. You spent $20,000 on the wedding. Had the best honeymoon could be manageable. But you had the best dress, the best outfit. Everybody was dressed alike, renting every car in the city. You did that. Now you got to deal with this person. Now, you don't love them like you did. What do you do? Four options, four options to this love situation. One, accept the reality and change your expectations. That doesn't work. You can decide, you know what? We ain't loving like we need, but you know, I need to change. I got to stop expecting as much out of you. And that's a possibility. A second option is really this. Improve communication skills and understanding each other better. Let me understand you better, understand me better, and at least that way that we can work together as a couple. And this, that some couples have done that, that's also a gift and a blessing. Third option I would not advise, and that is that except it's not going to change and leave your mate. Don't do that. Don't do that. There's another option to be considered. And the one I want to build upon is this one here, actually. And that is instead of trying to fall in love, learn to build love by loving the one you're with. Love the one you're with. How do you do that? Well, it's based on the premise here. I'm going to share with you. you got to understand the concept of two concepts. How much effort was put into your dating, right? How long did you date for your final person? You may say, I, I started dating at 14 and I got married at 25. Okay, so you, you dated from 14 to 25. You put 11 years into finding the right person. I started dating 15. I got married at 30. Okay, so you spent 15 years of your life dating and dating and finding people until you finally found the person you thought you spent your life with. You spent all that time getting ready to find the right person. It took you all those years to get the person you want to spend time with. More attention was spent finding someone than you have spent trying to love that person. Understand, friend, it is your love and connection that's changed. You got to learn how to rebuild it. How was love built? You got to first understand yourself. You see, there's two there's two parts of you in the context of our conversation, right? The, the Bible talks about in 1 Thessalonians 5 about the idea of how we have more than one part. But I, I want you to understand 1 Thessalonians 5 identifies we are flesh, we are soul, and we are spirit. Yes, you have three parts of you. I want to talk about two of the parts inside of your flesh, if you will. Flesh and soul piece of you, right? You ever had a statement, the idea, you said, I was upset at myself. I was upset at myself. Huh. Who, who is the I in that statement? Who is the myself in that statement? It's key to understand 
it identifies, you're not schizophrenic, it identifies as there's some conversation that you got to consider. You are a trichotomy of body, soul, and spirit. However, however, there is a component of you that's key to understand the relationship between your soul and your body that's part of this key component. And understanding that idea, your relationship is, takes part in this you concept. I've had to learn how to understand the difference between my soul and my flesh. They are always in conversation with each other. Most days, most days I'll get up in the morning, I'll go to the gym, I'll, I'll try to do weights Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I'll try to do elliptical Tuesday and Thursday. And without fail, without fail, my soul, the I say to myself, the flesh I'm trying to control, get up and go. My flesh, without fail, says, I don't want to go. I tell myself that. I, my soul, has watched my flesh eat things that it didn't really need. My soul don't need food. My body does. So uh, my soul has watched my fault. My, my soul has watched my body eat things saying, you don't need all that. Have you lost your mind? And if I'm not careful, my body does not know how to control itself. It's key to understand how these two characteristics function inside of you because we tend to love people based on their role and not based on their soul. And when you love folk based on their role, it's a flesh giving concept. But understand the idea of this. It is everything about you. It is the role you play in life. It's your physique, your finances, your personality, your abilities, your disposition, your environment, your life outlook that you see. All the observable things about you is the role idea of you. It's the fleshly part of you that's driven by your perspective of role. This part of you of flux is known, it's more changeable. Your, your conflicts happen because of the roles you play. Do you love your partner based on the roles they play in your life? Or do you love them to their soul? Do you love them based on who they are and what God's trying to make them to be? If you learn the power of loving a person based on their soul and not based on their role, you have the capacity to love them in spite of themselves. Character are these components of your personality, their physical look, their how they handle finance, their, 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 their abilities, their, their disposition. All these things are generally flesh components of a person. If you connect with your partner based on their role, your love will change because roles change. She doesn't look like she did when she was 19. She doesn't talk like she did when she was 24. She doesn't, she doesn't act like she did when she was in her younger years. Now she's changed. Oh, he's not like he was back in the day. I could depend on this. Now I can't depend. He's supposed to be doing this and she should be doing that. These role views are key in a relationship, but I want you to know you have to get to a spiritual component where you stop looking at that person based on their role. What's soul love like? Well, soul love, friend, is based on wisdom not work. When you first love your partner, they, they felt they could be themselves. You love me for who I was. You, you knew my weaknesses and my shortcomings. You saw me and when my hair was messed up and you thought I was still beautiful. You, when I, when I would say things that were off, you would say, oh, that's so sweet, baby. You, you, you overlooked every indiscretion I would mess up with. And when I did do something wrong and I knew you were hurt, I tried to change. I could burp in front of you. I could say things in front of you. You weren't judgmental about everything I said. You, you weren't nitpicky about everything. I could be transparent and know that you loved me for who I am, not for how I am on the outside, but who is inside of that body. That's why you loved me. A soul love, the key is seeking to go back to loving them because you value the real person. Love is not blind. Love is seeing you with your weaknesses, with your shortcomings and saying, I believe, maybe not this week, maybe not this month, maybe not this year, I believe in time, as Paul says in Philippians chapter one, verse six, the God who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. I'm living with you and I'm dealing with you because I believe there's a future that God can create wisdom. Wisdom is the capacity to make decisions in the present based on the future. Not what you're feeling right now. 
not whether you're happy right now, not whether you're unhappy right now. It, a soul kind of love is a love that sees a person and says, I understand your weakness, I understand your shortcomings, and I still care. Soul love is to love a person to their core. And although their flesh messes up and makes decisions, things that upset you, this is the part of you that observes you. And so when I look at myself and I say, I don't believe you did that. I don't believe you ate that. I, I'm identifying. There's a part of me. The soul is looking at my flesh and the soul is saying to my flesh, I got to get you in line. And sometimes, sometimes maybe, maybe the problem is that your partner hasn't learned how to control the, the flesh yet. Your soul has to learn how to train your flesh. When addictions run wild in your life, it's because your flesh has run amok. When you can't control your desire for food or for drugs or for alcohol or for pornography, whatever it is, it's a, it's a fleshly issue. And the stronger, whatever side you feed, if you feed your, your flesh, your flesh goes stronger. You feed your spirit, your spirit goes stronger. Whatever you feed will grow. And so this is a spiritual issue. The problem in your marriage is not a a flesh problem, it's a soul problem. Therefore, it's the unchanging I of the you that exists. It's the unchanging I who speaks to my you. And some of you, I, I talked to a couple not long ago, I was talking to a brother and he, he said, man, we got an argument, my wife and I got an argument the other week he said man you know i was i was it was ugly so i called her name she called me names i put her down she put me down we attacked each other that was his and her flesh trying to destroy because hurt flesh hurts flesh when you think and function based on your soul you have a life of joy see the key to soul love is to go back to loving your partner based on their soul not focusing on all the things they do wrong, not holding the grudge from what you did last year and 10 years ago. And I'll never forget what you did to me. I always hold this over. You will die, will die with my last dying breath remembering and you will spend the rest of your life in misery. Do you not know, do you not know that when you play security on a job, you never get to rest? The criminal mind is always at work. Therefore, if you decide in your relationship, I'm gonna play security from now on. And when you play security, you can't love and play security. You gotta decide to love a person based on what they can become, not just based on what they are right now. You gotta love to love them. Loving your partner is there at their soul means loving them without condition. That's how God loves us. The security you begin with came from dropping conditions and connected because I see your soul. I see you at your heart. You're good. Everybody in this congregation, every member of this church, they are here because everyone has the stamp of the nature and the character of God in them. My job is to spend time trying to pull, pull that God out of you where it's strong enough to control you because there's something in your flesh that's got a grip on you. I believe God can pull it out. He's trying to use all of us in his family together to to help pull that soul to a place where it looks more like God. That's why the Bible says when you get, well, that's the Bible, but in our wedding ceremonies, we say in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, for better, or for worse. That's, that's, in sickness is soul love. For poorer is soul love. For worse is soul love. Is loving what is not seen and what is eternal. I, I don't know what battle your relationship is having right now. I, I don't know what, what challenge is ripping at your heart right now. I don't know what has got you to a place where you feel like I'm quitting, I'm through with this marriage thing. I wanna challenge you. Maybe you need a new perspective. 90% of reality is perception. Choose to flip your perspective and say, maybe I should look at you and accept. Not like I'm expecting perfection. No, you are raggedy. You know why I know you're raggedy? I know you're raggedy because I'm raggedy. Because there are things wrong with me too. Maybe I should stop 
focusing all your faults because where love is thick, faults are thin. And where faults are thick, then love is thin. Friend, you gotta know how to love a person. I love you because I love your soul. I believe that God is trying to do something with you that I may not understand yet, that I may not see yet. I believe that God has got a plan he's trying to activate in our lives right now. And I'm believing that, that if I trust him even right now, I depend on him right now, he's going, to take, he's going to take me. He's going to use me to help you be better. I believe that God is going to take our weaknesses and our shortcomings. And, and I, Lord knows, I got some good reason to be mad at you and say, I can't stand you. However, I am deciding now, I'm going to look at you differently. I'm going to find what's redeemable about you. What makes you worth my investment? I saw it when I met you. I saw it when I got with you initially, but maybe, maybe if I look harder, I'll look at you and I'll say, I think I can learn to love you. Even though there are things about you that bring me hurt and, and bring me pain. And don't act like you can't do that because you do that with your kids. And every child you've had disappoints you at some point, man, makes bad decisions. You look at this, I don't believe you did that. I don't believe you did that. I'm almost finished with you. But you still are not finished with those kids, are you? Why? Because you love them to their soul. Therefore, you don't quit. You don't stop. You love them even when. They seem unlovable. And God says, once you learn to love your partner like I love you. That's what Jesus said. He emphasized in John 13 to his apostles, they will know you by your love. He said that to the disciples, if you are a disciple of his, a child of his, he says to you, others will look at you and they would know you belong to the Lord because you can love your mate even though you know there are things about them that would make them unlovable. And I really wrestle with this issue. Is it really love if I don't have a reason not to love you? If all you do is do good, and make me happy, we ain't got no struggle. Is it real love? How much of it is love when I can see things in you that frustrate me? And I say, I love you so much, I'm overlook that. Set that aside. I'm gonna love you because God has called me to love you. Not because you're perfect and not because you're all I want you to be. I'm going to stop loving you to your role. I'm going to start loving you to your soul. I want to see you saved. I want God to take us to the end of this path together. And I'm going to learn to love who you are, not the dumb stuff you do and the crazy thing you say and how you act at times. I'm going to love you for I believe that God has began a good work in you. And I believe he's going to bring it to completion. You can't do this without being in the Lord. If you're not a part of the family of God, you got to believe that Jesus, the son of the living God, have a change of mind. We call that repentance. Decide, I'll confess my belief in him as the son of the living God, and I'll be baptized in Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. He'll add me to his family. I'll have to die to our wars and come alive to somebody else. God can change your mate, but you can't. Ask God to work on him. Pray to the father. Say, Lord, would you work on my partner? Pray, ask God to guide them, lead them, ask God to, to bless them to get better, not to get rid of them. Lord, bless me to get better at helping this person be more what you want them to be. You brought them into my life so I can impact them. As I close out, 
I want to challenge you again to assess this connection and access this bond. Ask God, what does he want you to do with this person to get them where they need to be? Love them to their soul. You have a chance to come to the great city of Indianapolis, Indiana. You got to come by the King's Ontario Church of Christ because you can't get the blessing God got for you for your relationship in your life until you contact us and spend some time in the presence of the saints inside this, this wonderful city. The gifts of God are here. He's going to bless you. He's going to bless that marriage. He'll make it better when you let him make you better. He'll do his job. You do yours. May God bless you as he holds you in his hand, as he empowers you and molds you to love a person and not just your mate, but your children in the family and the people inside the church and the folk down the street. When you love everybody to their soul, it will change you and God will bless you and make you great. May God mold you and hold you in this New Top Church of Christ, 2101 Martin Luther King Boulevard, Northeast, right here in Winter Haven. Your place of refuge, your safe haven. Refuge let. Here we love God's creation. Refuge from disappointment. Here we encourage God's creation. Refuge from hunger. Here we feed God's creation. Refuge from loneliness. Here we are family. Refuge from the evil one. Here we teach biblical salvation. Hilltop, the congregation of the one church, the body of Christ. Where we worship God, putting Him first in all things. We welcome you to come see for yourself. Come enjoy the peace and the love that God has blessed us with. Let us share that peace and that love with you. See you next Lord's Day. Until then, know that Hilltop is here for you.